And so I'm just going to kick, kick us off. So AJ Lothar, he is a DEI rotational program specialist and is celebrating two years with Cuter Mutual Group. He's also a member of the 100 Black Men of Madison and has sat on the board of the Madison Network of Black Professionals and the ACT SO Committee of the NAACP. At CUNY Mutual Group, AJ serves as the co-lead for the African American Engagement Resource Group, ERG, and recruits top talent from HBCUs. And I would be remiss if I did not mention that he is a proud alumni of the Prairie View a and University. Welcome, AJ. So moving right along, Alicia, so happy to have Alicia here, uh, who's the campus program manager for CUNY Mutual Group. She's been there for three years, and during her time there, she's devoted a lot of time creating opportunities for all professionals to excel, as well as inspiring students um, and creating opportunities for them. Her ideas and passions towards overseeing CUNY Mutual Group's internship program and diversity efforts are outstanding. And she was also a finalist for CUNY Mutual Group's prestigious award, Values in Practice in 2018. Alicia is a proud alum of Alabama State University and a very proud member also of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. As an AKA, I will not hold that against you. Okay, I love you. We all love you. We all sisters. <sighs> Moving right along to Troy, Troy Bandon Jr. He is a business specialist who is finishing up his fifth year at BQ. Uh, Troy has focused his work toward the movement and advancement of Black and Brown people in this community. Long overdue, and it's just awesome that so many people are continuing the work that Troy has already been doing. At BQ, Troy sits on the BID Council, which is um, an acronym for Belonging, Inclusion, Leveraging, and Differences. He's also the founder and chairman of the Black Alliance Cooperation, also known as BAC, where he um, leverages um, BQ's Black employees and the fight for a more equitable workplace in the community. Welcome, Troy. Moving on to Courtney Jackson. Uh, Courtney's the Director of Communications for the Carolinas Credit Union League, uh, and she's been with the league for over 10 years as of this May. Congratulations on that monument. Um, during her time um, at CCUL, she served uh, for six years as a program coordinator for the association CU Aware Protege Competition, which helps showcase the value and potential in credit union professionals aged 35 and under in the Carolinas. Um, and Courtney um, has a, been a proud member of this organization, AACUC, for over three years. She served um, on the host committee 2017 and 2019, um, and she's also a volunteer member of the Southern Regional Chapter of AACUC. Um, so welcome, Courtney. Uh, Letitia Wheeler. Letitia is the Youth Outreach Coordinator for DC Credit Union. Uh, she's a DC native, and she's been with the credit union for over 14 years. Um, um, Tisha attends community events. She coaches the youth participating in the city's summer internships and those participating in the city's rehabilitation services to learn good money habits. Direly needed in this city. I uh, live in Maryland outside of DC, so loving all the great work that Tisha is, is doing. And because of her energy and commitment to spreading knowledge about the credit union, she has become the de facto youth outreach coordinator. Welcome, Letitia. And to round out our panel of awesome under, under 30 panelists, under 40 panelists, um, is Miranda Pierfax. She is the executive assistant at the USC Credit Union, and she's been there for 14 years, which is amazing. Uh, she's currently the social media ambassador for AACC West Coast chapter, and um, has been that ambassador since December. So welcome, Miranda, and welcome to all of our panelists. Awesome. Yay. Okay, I like the silent claps. That's awesome. Thanks, guys. Okay, so we're going to try to keep it kind of limited because we want to give as many, um, we have, as you can see, we have a number of panelists. And so we'll probably give maybe two to three persons um, amount of time to answer these questions. So first, I really want to hear from the men. Um, I really want to hear from AJ um, and also Troy because I'm really curious you know, what are some of the reflective thoughts, especially as a Black man, a Black professional who's accomplished so much, what were some of your reflective thoughts after the death of George Floyd and others? Like, he's not the only one, um, like Breonna Taylor. So why don't we start with you, AJ? Thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, so with regards to my reflective thoughts, I would say initially speaking, specifically towards um, the murder of Breonna Taylor. 
that it took me back to a little bit before my time, but 1969, where they murdered Fred Hampton in his bed asleep by the police. Uh, very similar situation uh, with the way that she was murdered and the way that he was murdered. Um, personally, I've never been a person to not have, uh, I don't want to call it a sense of power, but being able to control certain things and having things in my hands to be able to do something about it. Uh, I have a younger sister here with me in Madison. We're both from Texas. So we're really all that we have. Uh, prior to these events, I was not a gun owner. Um, but since then, that's the, the shift that I've taken. Uh, so what I've done is I've you know, purchased a firearm to protect me, my sister. Uh, I've taken my friends with me. And it's not necessarily from an offensive measure, but more so defensive. Because personally, I can't think of a way that Brianna Taylor could have done anything differently for the same outcome to not occur. She was asleep. She was in her bed. I don't think it could really be any more innocent than that. And so looking back on what I can do personally, um, to the best of my knowledge from reading the, the article and reading the statements released, um, the only reason that I can tell that her boyfriend was able to survive that encounter was because he was a gun owner and because he returned fire, personally. Uh, that may be more a little more radical than other people would respond to the situation, uh, but personally, I feel like that's the only way that he was able to come out of that situation alive. Uh, and so having a younger sister, having friends um, who, you know, are nicer and things like that. I feel that it's a responsibility of mine to make sure that they are equipped uh, with ways to protect themselves, protect their families, and not being stuck in a situation where they don't have any power and have a sense of hopelessness. Thank you, AJ. I've definitely heard a lot of people doing the same. I think that's, that's an important step. Um, Troy, I, I'd love to hear from you as well on some of your reflective thoughts on, on the recent killings of George Floyd and, and many others, especially our young black men. Morning, everybody. It's uh, 10 o'clock in the morning on the West Coast here. Mm -hmm. um, so while you guys are enjoying your afternoon, my, uh, my mornings are getting started here. Um, thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to see everybody's beautiful faces. Um, kind of like AJ, when I think about these murders, it, it makes me reflect on my, my little brother and my, my cousins um, and myself. Um, you know, America and the world, we have this emphasis on endangered species. We put so much money and so much effort into protecting these animals, um, yet young black men and women are being murdered and slaughtered and their killers are walking away a month later free buying coffee. Um, it's, it's sadden, it saddens me. Um, I feel angry, I feel frustrated, um, but also I feel a sense of urgency that we have to do something to change this narrative. We have to um, stop talking so much and do more action. Um, I think it's my generation and the generation that comes behind me that um, is really going to be the change agents for the world moving forward. Um, after these murders, you know, my organization was, what can we do now? How can we help? What, what movements can we make? And the question that came up is, why now? Why, why are these questions being asked now? And I, and I think that um, our society is ready for a change. And I, I think it's, it's just become, it's been way too much. Uh, especially for us who live through it, but there's been a mentality shift um, for society overall. And I think we should take, take this tragedy and turn it into triumph and really um, leverage this moment to make huge changes um, on, on so many levels, not only just with social uh, advocacy, but let's think about the broader, the broader, um, the broader scope. Let's think about banking. Let's think about healthcare. Let's think about education. Let's really wrap all of this stuff in 
and uh, let's move forward. Thank you, Troy. And you know what, AJ brought up a really good point and Brianna Taylor earlier, and I kind of want to give our female panelists the opportunity to speak something. I've recently seen it on social media, maybe many others of you have, uh, there's just an outpour from Black women who are feeling like there's still not justice to be done for Black women, for the Breonna Taylors of the world. And all of you all are just so accomplished in your careers, and I'm just so really curious from your perspective as a female, you know, do you feel as though, you know, Black women are marginalized? or left out or, or anything like that. So um, I'm just going to open the floor, Miranda, Leticia, um, Courtney, Alicia, if anybody wants to jump in there. Um, I want to jump in. Um, one, I want to say thank you to everyone. Um, it is wonderful to see all of your faces um, and a be amongst all of you. Um, when I think of Breonna Taylor um, situation, it I have a ton of emotion um, because as, as we all do, we think of her as our sister or our daughter. Um, and, you know, just like AJ said, thinking about what else could it, what else could she have done while sleeping in her bed um, and in her own home? Um, and I also think about AJ talking about, you know, owning a gun and the importance of um, her boyfriend at the time being able to try to attempt to protect them uh, once these officers barged into her home. But what I will say is over the last couple of weeks, I've experienced several emotions. I've went from being extremely sad to disappointed to outraged. Um, and I turned all of that into empowerment um, and into motivation to support uh, my fellow sisters and say her name and remind individuals of her and that she was important and her life was important. Um, and I think that's important for us Black women, that we support each other, that we encourage each other when necessary, stand up for each other. Um, and that has been my thought. Um, and, and I'm an action person, right? So what can I be doing um, individually to support the cause and give back? So I've been mentoring young girls in our community here in Madison and having authentic conversations with them around social injustices and being mindful of your surroundings and um, knowing that you're beautiful and you're worthy um, and that you have a purpose here on this earth. Um, so that has been um, my perspective when I think of Breonna Taylor and others who have lost their lives to police brutality um, in our country. Thank you so much, Alicia. Did anybody um, else? Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. So my, when I thought of Brianna and Taylor, um, as Alicia said, it was a lot of emotions. One, it was like, you, I just feel violated, although it didn't happen to me, but she was in her home. She was in her bed, in her own space. And for me, it's like, okay, anybody, come and violate your space we call this as if you're at work at home on the street on the corner and I'm always I always have um I'm a part of a lot of like group chats so I always have a tendency to say to reach out to a female group chat hey good morning how are you how, how are you doing are you all right um it's okay to say that you're not all right or you are having a moment and I think as females, black females, sometimes we as women have a tendency to not reach out to our other black women because of whether it be you didn't like her yesterday or you didn't like her 10 years ago. So it's like you always have a t <laughs> you have, a, have to have a tendency to step back and be like, okay, um, I'm going to do it for the sole purpose of my well-being and feeling better about myself and knowing that I can uplift someone else, a young colleague, or a person that I may not know. And we also have to step outside of the box and, and reach out to a young, a little girl, um, a little cousin, a little niece, um, someone else's child, like how our parents or my parents and aunts and uncle were raised, okay, you're gonna reach out, you're gonna help that child who doesn't have food or a neighbor 
or if you're not in the house by when the lights come on, I'm going to, you know, let your parent or child know. Like Alicia said, we also always have to be um, aware of our surroundings and who can we go to turn to when we need an, an uplifting voice or just a, a check-in moment. I'll stop right there. No, that was, that was good, Tish. Uh, I agree. Um, we got to support one another. I think that's an important piece as Black women. Um, so one thing I, I'd love to hear from you guys on, and uh, Courtney and Miranda, feel free to jump in. I know you guys haven't had a chance to jump in yet. Um, I found that a lot of these conversations, uh, especially for our allies and, and the members who aren't members of the Black community, I found that hearing a personal experience um, from someone that they know might change their views about racism and how real it is. Um, so I would love to hear from you all on if you can name an example, whether it's in your personal life, in your career, whether it was at credit unions or elsewhere, in your college experience that taught you a, a critical lesson about racism and maybe even made you even more aware of the fact that you are Black and that you, know, you are going to have probably a harder time. I can start off. Um, so, hi everyone. It's good to see you guys. <clears throat> um, so, when I was about 10 years old, we moved to a predominantly white neighborhood, and um, being the only black family on the on my block, it was very intimidating. Um, and we definitely were reminded that we are the only black family there. Um, but one incident in particular is where I realized, like okay, I am black because um, we got pulled over quite a few times um, and it just, they never gave us a ticket. It was just kind of like, why are you, what are you doing out here? What are you, uh, where are you going? Uh, one officer even asked how uh, my dad got this car. So um, it definitely was a wake up call. And, um, you know, even with uh, what's going on right now, I, I will say just being in LA, um, seeing how a lot of people are coming together and uh, there's such a diverse crowd in the protests. It does make me feel hopeful this time that something is going to happen as far as change. Like uh, there's going to be justice reform. There's going to be, um, you know, police being held accountable, hopefully. But um, just seeing, seeing that does give me hope. Yeah, I would just add, um, Miranda's story sounds almost exactly like one of my uh, examples when my family moved into a predominantly uh, white neighborhood. Um, and we were invited to a cul-de-sac hangout uh, where uh, one person thought it made sense to tell me as a child uh, the story of the tar baby um, as one of, the, one of the ways to um, introduce us to the neighborhood. Um, and I will say in that moment, when we were uh, abruptly leaving the gathering, um, a white gentleman came out and he knew exactly what was going on and he apologized uh, on behalf of that other family. But um, that's just one, ex one of the experiences and even bringing it up now brings those emotions back because, you know, I'm just a kid not really realizing that um, I'm different in a way that's not welcomed. Um, mm -hmm. And even most recently, two years ago, coming back from a credit union conference, um, an Uber driver basically almost didn't want to take me home. Um, I approach the car and uh, usually they help you with your bags. And he saw me and decided instead to get in the driver's seat and just let me load the luggage myself. Um, barely said two words to me the whole drive until we got to my neighborhood, uh, which happened to be a nice area in Cary. Uh, and his disposition changed entirely. Mm. Um, he wanted to help me quickly to get my bag and even said surprisingly, you know, I can't believe or wow, you live here. Um, mm. So just some of those stereotypes that we deal with, the subtle things, um, racism is not always violent. Um, it's it's uh, an oppression. It's a reminder of your place um, in this mm -hmm. world. And uh, it's it's an tiring experience to go through. Mm. It's those microaggressions, um, and I and I can't even imagine what it's being. A, I live in Maryland, D.C. It's very different, even in the South, and even for Miranda living in Los Angeles. I used to live in Los Angeles too, and I know the culture is different too. But we all have this shared experience, which kind of brings us together. 
Um, did anybody else want to answer the question of just sort of sharing a personal story um, about how they've experienced racism? Tori, Alicia, AJ, Tish? Um, yeah. The story about the Uber driver kind of hit home with me. When I was in Washington, D.C., I remember standing out with my hand in the air, a hella cab, and cab after cab after cab would just pass me by. Um, and it's those little microaggressions mm -hmm. that are left by a thousand cuts. You know, uh, Dama Alo in her book was talking about living as a black person in America is like walking down a street getting punched in the arm at random times, you know, and it's those microaggressions uh, that are killing us slowly, right? And, and not just live a life of frustration and It's very, very frustrating. Um, when I was in school in Massachusetts before I got down to Howard, um, there was a newspaper, just like any other collegiate um, institution, where you know you have your your Tribune or your weekly newspaper. And uh, one of my friends runs up to me. He's like, "Troy, have you seen the newspaper?" And uh, it was about about black squirrels. You know, you know, in Massachusetts and Western Massachusetts. Massachusetts, there's black squirrels, there's brown squirrels, gray squirrels. Uh, but what made this one extremely frustrating is instead of calling them black squirrels, they called them squiggers. And it was, <laughs> it was probably the most heart-wrenching, horrific thing I've ever read. And um, the problem is nobody's seen, seen an issue with it and they allowed it to be published. Um, and that just speaks to the systematic racism that um, other people don't see how this could affect um, the discomfort and just, you know, I mean, it's just, it, it was just a terrible, um, terrible thing to go through to see my friends look at this and not know what to do with this and, and what to do with the pain. Um, that's one of the reasons I started BAC at BECU is to give a forum and give a platform for uh, people of color to, to, to let out that frustration and have a place to talk about it and to actually heal. Um, I mean, as a young black male, my, my interactions with racism go to getting a jaywalk, it's jaywalking ticket. Like the only other person I ever heard of getting a jaywalking ticket was Tupac and, and like I I literally had on basketball shorts and a t-shirt and I was put up against the fence I was searched I mean my t-shirt was young I mean it was like it was tight you know I had a tight t-shirt on I was coming from football practice and there's no way I could hold a weapon or anything else and and I was treated like an animal I was treated like a criminal and um, it's these things that frustrate but also motivate me to try to make change and try to educate Thank you, Troy, and thank you all for sharing those experiences. Um, you know, they, they really hit home and really paint a vivid picture for what it's like in our daily lives. So I thank you for sharing that. And I think that there's just this crazy notion that, you know, oh, slavery was so long ago, you know, racism doesn't exist. And I, when you were in college, I, that couldn't be but a few years ago. And so to know that and we're still experiencing these things every day, I think it, it paints a really clear picture. Um, so moving on to our next question, I, I kind of want to talk about credit unions and the credit union movement. And even if you want to go beyond that and talk about, you know, equity, economics, and the financial industry in general. Um, as young professionals, um, you guys have your own accolades. You've done a lot already, especially you, Troy, um, by way of supporting your black and brown family. Um, you know, the question is, how can young professionals, um, you know, like ourselves, help their credit union you know, or organization um, make a commitment to change and unite against racism. Everyone kind of knows about what AACUC is doing by way of that. And if you had to you know, pick something that you would say is a really important strategy um, for uniting against racism, what would that be? Um, I think for me, um, silence is consent. So if I haven't um, seen an organization speak out 
about the injustices our black and brown communities are experiencing, to me that means that they are comfortable with it. Um, so I definitely think silence is consent. Um, I think that this is the perfect time for organizations to roll out a plan. So are you donating to the HBCUs around our country and not just the big three? Are you providing financial literacy opportunities? Um, are we having mentorship programs? Um, I think it's important that um, organizations also talk about um, hiring processes, right? So let's look at that and how we can improve our hiring process and hiring diverse individuals. Even going as far as to say, we want to hire this many number of diverse individuals into our organization. We want to give $50,000 to PV or Alabama State University or Morehouse or Howard University. We wanna dedicate resources and tools to those folks that are in the black and brown communities. I think that is a great start. Um, and I think it's also a great start to have these conversations. I'm very grateful to work for CUNY Mutual Group where this is a continuous conversation. Um, I think about CUNY Mutual Group being a predominantly white organization and getting comfortable with being uncomfortable about talking about the issues that are happening in our black and brown communities. That makes me feel like there's space for me to express myself, bring my authentic self and heal like Troy said. Because a lot of times in our black and brown communities, it's this idea that we suppress it and we have to move forward and we need to be strong and we need to be resilient. Um, and I think this is the time to really talk and have an authentic conversation so we can heal and then we can come together and unite and start creating some programs and organizations that can um, help our communities. Absolutely. I like what you said about um, being comfortable, being uncomfortable, I think is like a really small but big step that I think especially non-Black people kind of have to take toward this. AJ, I think I saw you take yourself off mute, so feel free to jump in. Yeah, I had a thing to add. Um, okay. <laughs> so I want to say, first off, uh, donating to HBCUs. I'm an advocate as an HBCU graduate. I feel like Morehouse and Howard have gotten more than their fair share. Donate to any, there's hundreds of others. Uh, no disrespect towards either of those prestigious institutions. Um, but I will say that with regards to what us as young professionals can do uh, to really, uh, you know, push change and push how people can unite is that we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility because we have more freedom than those who came before us. You know, if you spoke freely or you spoke any type of way where, you know, your manager, your supervisor, your boss, different people like that uh, were to hear you, then you had a chance of being fired. You had a chance of being blacklisted, et cetera. Um, luckily, you know, us as being younger professionals in the world that we're in today, we have more freedom to express those concerns. We have more um, platforms such as social media, engagement resource groups, different conferences, et cetera, to really push those narratives and get that education and those perspectives out there. And since we have that freedom, that also comes with the responsibility and even the duty, if you will, to really have forced those conversations to happen, to really lead those topics, to lead those, um, those discussions, to make it a forefront. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can't expect people who are, you know, higher up and had to, I guess, kind of put their own agendas on the back burner to really take the initiative on everything. Mm -hmm. If anything, then, you know, make them a part of your network, network mm -hmm. with them so that way they can get you into those conversations so that you as a young professional with that freedom that you have and that unique perspective that you bring to be able to push and say, hey, this is what we can do uh, economically. This is what we can do as a social program. This is what we can do within our credit union for our specific uh, membership base that really works for them, you know. That's the way I see it, at least, um, that with the freedoms that we have and with the, the, I guess you can call it a little bit more wiggle room to speak our minds, um, that it comes with that responsibility to really lead those conversations because it wasn't an option for those who came before us so that we could have those freedoms. Oh, 
that's great perspective. Look, Tisha, I think you're going to jump in also. Yes, yeah, so it was also, Alicia has said something about um, CUNA and being predominantly white and um, so, so forth. So me being an alumni of CUNA Management School, um, we, we took part in different, it was a class, a diversity class, and it was, at the end of that class, it was like, I was in the class of 100, and so out of that 100, it was only that were Black. So to hear um, peers, because you never, you didn't know their name, it was like a, you asked a question and you write a response down, and the instructor would just pull out a response and read it. And to be in a classroom and to hear different peers and their thought about a Black person, a Muslim, a brown person, and you could be, I could be sitting like two seats down from them, behind them, in front of them, and the four of us that were um, Black, we, when the class ended, it was just silence. It was like we had to take a moment to digest it, to take a moment to think like how we were raised or how our mother or father taught us to be we're in a situation um, I think for us, if we were to just like really get up abruptly in the classroom, walk out, they would just basically like we crazy, like, okay, where, what happened? What's going on? But out of that conversation, it was a few other classmates that came to us and be like, hey, this is my first time around a Black person. This is my first time interacting with a Black female or a Black male. And looking at us, it was like, I've never seen, you know, this Black people interact with more, with boys, with ability to how you talk, how you're educated, how you interact. And they were willing to like, hey, just, I'm, I'm sitting here, let me know, what can I do? What can I do to be better, be a better person? So when I go back to my credit union, I can um, input it. Um, I can reach out to you. I can ask questions. And I think for going back, bringing it back to credit unions, as you go back to your credit unions, if you're not at the table, try to get at the table. If an idea comes and your supervisor or your director or your CEO or someone says, hey, what are your thoughts about this? It doesn't mean that it might not happen right right away, but they can come back to you like, hey, Tisha, you, you said this a month ago and now we want to plan or move forward with what, what other ideas that can be implemented into um, your credit union. It doesn't have to be like a big poster. You can start off small. You can you can start off small and also get to piggyback what AJ said, network. Network with people that you have, you have never met, you have no idea. Go up and say, hey, my name is such and such and what is it that you do? Take a card, interact with people that's not inside your circle. Um, go outside your circle, go outside your community, go outside your state, your city, um, and network that way and bring it back to your credit unions to say, hey, this is, this is what I learned, this is what I took from it, and I just want to share my thoughts, so. Absolutely. I like what was said just about we have responsibility. I'm sorry, Miranda, were you going to jump in? Yeah, um, I just wanted to piggyback off of what Alicia had said. As far as the hiring um, is concerned, I feel like the justice um, system has made it so hard for a lot of minorities to try and get jobs. I was speaking to uh, one of our uh, VPs yesterday and she told me that we don't really get applications from Black people. And that hurt me. And so, but then, you know, uh, my boss, shout out to Gary Perez, had um, gave me this idea of, you know, there's people that have to go through background checks and we automatically disqualify them because, you know, of a nonviolent offense. And so maybe if we could look into our hiring practices and maybe, you know, um, not really discount someone just because they had a non-criminal offense in the past. Um, but I also think that we should, um, like T uh, Tisha was saying, as far as like um, having a voice at the table, don't feel like you can't speak up, but also hold people accountable. Like if you're 
credit union says like, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And it's gone on for months and nothing has happened and speak up. And, you know, um, I also feel like it's important for us to be a part of that change and to, to talk about it and to also like, let's say if I want to be more in the community, I'm, I shouldn't just ask like, oh, can I do this? I, I feel like I should come up with a plan and be like, hey, this is what I want to do for the, the black and brown community around Los Angeles. So yeah, I just feel like um, just being accountable and then also um, take action. I, Go ahead, Troy. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, I love what everybody was saying. And I think the other thing, just to kind of piggyback off of what Tisha was saying is be fearless. Um, you know, Tisha held one of, one of the members of BAC. She always says, they bleed like you. Uh, they're humans just like you, so you deserve a right to be at the table. So when you're engaging your uh, executive management team or your bosses or uh, people in the community, even your peers, uh, be fearless uh, in your walk and, and make sure that um, you're standing on grounds of, of moral and principle and knowing that you're doing this to make a change and, and make the world better. Love it. Start where you are. We have a responsibility. All very important and very true. So to move uh, to our next question, which kind of ties to this question. And, you know, I know that some of you already have already done this sort of work within your credit union or your organization. You've already been vocal. You've been fearless in approaching the leadership. Like, have you faced any challenges? as you brought about change. I know, Troy, you started your own organization within BQ. I, I know many others of you have done initiatives, like have you run into trouble? And the part B to that question is, how can your, let's call it more seasoned colleagues help you? Uh, we have a lot of those more seasoned colleagues on the line right now who are in those places of position and power, and how can they be your ally as well? So that's sort of a two-part question, but I'll, I'll open the floor if any would like to jump in there first. Um, I guess I'll start. Uh -huh. Jump in once. <laughs> I'll call on you guys. But I like um, <laughs> so I know you said challenges and then seasoned colleagues can help, right, Lauren? Yes, you can, and you can pick one if you, you know, you can pick one of the two, yeah. Okay. Um, I, for me, for my, in my credit union, um, I don't, I haven't faced a challenge where I wasn't able to voice or share my ideas. Um, I think for me personally, my challenge, and I guess I created for myself, is to bring along the young people that are in my credit union that do not um, get involved or choose not to share an idea. Um, and I think for those colleagues that are of seasoned age to lit I think to listen um to not just say oh you are young so you don't know or you wasn't born back in my day but it's 2020 so you were born in the 19 xx so you you kind of got to listen first and then and then respond um a lot of times we as working with different colleagues and different age groups, we don't do that. We don't do a good job of listening. We just jump right in and then we want to hurry up and get a solution and not um, a plan. Um, and I think that we all, we all can work together, whether it be young and seasoned, we all can work together because I can learn something from those colleagues that have been there that, and they can learn something from me that have just started. I think AJ said it, you know, we as the young professionals, we have a, a lot more wiggle room where we can always adjust, adapt to any different environment and be always available to add our input. It might not be, it can be direct at times as young professionals, it can be direct, it can be blunt, but also take the heat to learn from your seasoned colleagues and, and vice versa. Um, I agree with Tisha as well. I think um, I was talking to AJ last night as we were going through the questions and, and really trying to think through them to be ready for the call. 
Um, I was telling AJ, I think this is a wonderful opportunity for two generations to mesh and fight against the racial injustices that we're all experiencing. Um, I think it's an opportunity for correction, right? As a young professional, I cling to the wisdom of seasoned, my, my seasoned folks, especially the ones that look like me, of how I can thrive in my community. So I, I think it's a, a great opportunity to learn from each other. Um, AJ talked to this, that our generation has social media and different technologies and different resources. But I think that can be also meshed with the experience of our seasoned um, uh, networks to be able to produce change and work towards change. Um, and I know we talked a little bit about these challenges. Um, and again, AJ and I talked about this. I think a lot of times our young professionals struggle with that continuous feedback being corrected. Um, and I, I am big on feedback and criticism because I know that it's room for me to grow and be better. Um, and who better to correct you that, that can see you from a different perspective? Um, so I think our seasoned colleagues or, or friends or networks can definitely help by uniting with us and using both our tactics and resources um, to join together and unite and fight against the injustices we experience. Love it. I think, yeah. Mentorship is just such a big thing, even if you're not a direct mentor. I was oh. going to say, uh, oh, go no, ahead. Alicia, it's called, we, they, everyone calls it constructive criticism. We have to be open to receiving it too, right? Because I know some Yes. So I'm not going to, you know, we, we got to do better. Our generation has to do better. Um, I like to always call it this idea of like reaching back and reaching forward. Like it's so, it's paramount to be able to like get to that next level. Like we have to reach up and then they have to reach back in order for everyone to be successful for years to come. So I love that perspective, Alicia. Um, so moving on, um, are, we have just a couple questions left. So we'll make sure we get you guys out here on time. Um, so we hear a lot about DEI, right? We hear about it all the time. But what does that look like? What does an inclusive culture, work environment, credit union industry, what does that look like? And I could be, you know, we can keep it specific to inclusive for black people since kind of, that's kind of our topic for, for today, but you can expand it if you'd like. But I, I'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, Courtney, I know we haven't gotten you in there, so please feel free to jump in on this question. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so when I think demographically about what an inclusive environment would look like, um, I look to a recent campaign um, one of my hobbies is in the beauty industry, and one of the things they started is called Pull Up for Change, uh, where they are challenging that particular industry um, to look at getting 10% Black corporate employment. Um, and that number didn't come out of thin air. It came from a 2019 study that showed that uh, there's a, the equal percentage, 10% of Black college degree holders. So there's already an existing market of black professionals qualified for these jobs, but they're not getting the opportunity to be employed um, in that industry. So they were challenging brands to, uh, that were showing Black Lives Matter support on their platforms and um, on their websites to show, make that reflected within their corporate offices, within their boards. Um, so I would say the same thing needs to apply to our industry. Um, not only should your field, field of membership be reflected in your credit unions and your organization, but it needs to lead all the way to your leadership, um, the decision makers, the idea generators, uh, and then uh, your boards as well. Um, the, the diversification will help with the ideas that come to your organization, the services you offer, and better set your credit union up to succeed for years to come. So it's good business sense as well. Miranda, anybody else want to jump in here? What does an inclusive work environment look like to you? We can jump to the next question, if not, but definitely we can give you guys some time. Well, yeah, I would just I would just like to add, you know, um, when I, when I think about inclusion, I also think about we need to learn to celebrate each other as well. I don't know, inclusion kind of seems more of um, you know being able to just deal with another culture, another mm -hmm. race, 
um, I think what's important is the celebration and the respect of that culture. It's okay to be different. It's okay to have a different culture. Um, it is not okay to uh, oppress a person because of that. Or, um, you know, when I think about having conversations with some allies or some of my white colleagues, they say, you know, we all start at the same space. And, and I just think of, a, of the analogy of like a track field, right? A circle track. Um, if we're all starting on the same line in different lanes on that track, anybody who knows what track, the further you go towards the crowd, the longer that lane is. And oftentimes we may be on the same line but we're on different lanes in that, on that track. And our lane has hurdles, our lane has long jumps, our lane has a couple pole bolts, and we have to go through those hurdles. We may be running the same race, but we're on different lanes. And we have to realize that we need to make sure that we're making it equitable for everyone that's involved and, and, not real, and, check, our, and check our privilege as well. Um, and that's the biggest thing. We need to make sure that we are checking our own privilege and that we're opening the door for those conversations for other people to check theirs as well. I love that image of the, the, uh, the hurdles and the, the, the running. I just dropped in the chat an example that I've seen all across social media and it kind of brought me to tears just to see all of our black brothers and sisters all the way at the beginning of the finish line, at the, at the start of the finish line. Um, and I, I guarantee you still, some of them will still outpace some of those people who started off a little bit longer, even because we run quick, you know, we run quick as we've had to. So I love that. I love that, Troy. So check that, check that out. It's in the chat, guys, when you have a chance. Um, so moving on to just our last two questions, um, you know, as we kind of look at what's in our industry, I know that there's ERG groups, there's um, a lot that is out there by way of inclusion for your for, for black people but what did you what do you think that is missing um, that could best support black men and women I mean I know for one for me even looking at my organization it's having someone at the top who reports to the president and CEO that is missing um, so if there's something like that that you all can think of uh, I think it would help shed some light to everyone on the call um, I I'm sorry for talking to twice. No, it's okay. Go ahead. Um, so before I started as a business specialist, I was a member consultant and that's a non-exempt job. So that means I'm, I, I was hourly, right? Um, and the biggest hurdle that my, we call them ECGs at BECU, so employee connection groups, is to make sure that everybody is able to participate in discussions like this. Uh, there's members of my organization that aren't able to be on this call because they are hourly. Uh, there's members of, of my organization who are single mothers who are not able to be on the phone late at night because of, uh, you know, their single motherhood, right? Um, and we have to be creative with making sure, whether it's through technology or allowances through the organizations to allow more people to have and be a part of conversations like this. And um, until we do that and check our privilege and realize that a salary or us people who work from home are not the only ones who need to hear these conversations, um, we have to figure a, a creative way to make sure that we get this message out to everybody. If I can, I, I wanna piggyback off uh, that idea that Troy proposed about how to bring more access Two opportunities like this because I, I find great value in it as well. Um, one of my ideas, and this may be making more work for Renee, but um, <laughs> I would love for AACUC to step up to having an online network presence um, where people can go on their off time to connect with their colleagues, with um, other training professionals across the country uh, to carry on these conversations even if they can't make the live calls. Um, and then I would add to that another project for AACUC is I'd love to see a online resource where I can learn about the African American contributions to the movement. Um, here in the Carolinas, we, we do have some record of uh, African American credit unions that were founded here um, mm -hmm. in the state and the contributions of some African American leaders, but there's no 
central place for us to find that information. And it's so important because we're an intrinsic part of this history. I wouldn't be surprised if Renee tasked you with that, Courtney. Might be, you might be our chairman of those initiatives now that you've raised it. Go ahead, Miranda. Um, I just wanted to say one little thing with that. Um, I noticed that um, quite a few people that do work for us, um, they don't have a background as far as um, a, a degree. And so I would like for us to try and get them those skills, like an educational background or something that would build them to make them feel like they can have a position like me. Like, you know, although I started off as a, a teller, I moved up within our industry and I, I'm now an executive assistant. Yes, I do have a degree, but I just, I don't want them to lose hope. And so I, I definitely, and, and I, I need to hold myself accountable as, as far as creating something to just make our employees feel more empowered and feel that they can have different positions within the job. They're not limited to just, you know, a teller just because they don't, um, they don't have enough uh, educational background. Um, also to piggyback on what Miranda said, I started off as a teller also, and um, one of my other titles is I am an executive assistant to the senior management team. So I am always at the, the meetings and the board meetings, and I always pick the brains of our directors, and, um, and they always pick my brain about what are my thoughts and so forth. So to also say that, yes, you don't necessarily um, have to have a degree to move up in your, um, in your job, but you can also look at your job also, is this the career that you want to do? And then also build your professional development around that too. I mean, I'm not knocking anyone that has a fantastic degree in their um, alumni universities. That's great. I am all for it. But that's also, I think in, in, um, in our community, like men, Black men and women, it's always so, so a lot of times young people tend to follow the footsteps of their parents. Like, okay, my parents went to college. My parents did this. My parents did this. I want to follow um, in their footsteps. And then sometimes some people can be shy to step away from a no, I don't want to follow in my parents' footsteps, but I want to, this is my, the career that I want to be a, build, and this is my plan of how I'm going to get there too. But. Absolutely. Um, and piggybacking off of uh, Tisha, uh, I think that's awesome that you stated um, you don't have to excel in your career by having a degree. Um, but I think for this particular question, it, it's important at this time that credit unions leverage marketing during this time. Um, credit unions offer extraordinary products and services for folks that are in our community. So I think this is an awesome time to promote those unique opportunities, um, promote business loans and becoming an entrepreneur um, and, and being that credit union that's there every step of the way. Um, because if I join your credit union at 13 years old, I, you have my loyalty through college, through my career, through getting a home, um, so there is an opportunity for credit unions definitely to um, show how unique they are, especially during this time. So that's my small input there. Absolutely. Well, I'll go ahead and hop in on yeah, it since no everybody problem. else is getting some. Uh, <laughs> um, personally, um, you know, working in the credit union industry, two years, but being in part of the credit union movement, it's literally been since birth. Uh, my mom was part of a credit union, my dad, me, so on and so forth. Um, and honestly, I would say the, I guess a, a fair title to put over it would be alternative underwriting. And the reason I say that is because I'll use a personal example. So I graduated college. I got my job offer from CUNA Mutual. I needed to move across the country, get an apartment, et cetera, all within about a month time frame. So being in college, I don't have a few thousand dollars just lying around to, to make this happen. So I go to my credit union and I ask for a personal loan. I show them my offer letter, et cetera. And I was still denied the loan 
because of the way that their underwriting is. Now, I'm not saying they should just give away money, but I feel that um, the same way that everyone's definition of financial success and financial freedom is different than the pre people's personal financial situations or however you want to call it is different. You know, you may not have been a homeowner for 25 years and have land and have collateral to put up, but you may have been renting your apartment for 10, 15 years, always up to date on your bills, et cetera. You have a, you manage your debt. You may be debt free, whatever the case. So there shouldn't be one particular standard of what a successful financial portfolio looks like. You may not have collateral to put up, but you have facts and evidence that show that you've managed your payments, you're able to manage your finances. So if there's something that you're aiming for, that you're aspiring for, there should be some type of system in place to be able to recognize that, you know, like I'm, that's just the way I see it at least. Um, not too many people I know that look like me, myself included, like my, not, none, none of my, neither of my parents went to college. We don't own a bunch of land. We don't have a lot of things to put up for collateral. Um, similar to other people, who, well, I'm gonna say similar, opposite of other people who may be applying for a loan, whether it be small business, personal, what have you, um, who may have something to put up, who, oh yeah, my parents had this home, et cetera. So having ways to alternatively look at someone's financial portfolio, I definitely see that as something that would be a benefit to the, to the black community uh, when looking at the financial industry. Absolutely. I really like that, AJ. I really do. Um, and I think that's, that's huge. And when you, when you think about that, right, you also have to take in, consideration, take in consideration systematic racism with redlining, with uh, mortgage, mortgages and everything else. It's, it's uh, I want to say it's on purpose. <laughs> it's on purpose that as, as a young Black person, getting out of college that you don't have the collateral, your family doesn't have the collateral to move your generational wealth forward. Um, and that's what we, I believe that we should be addressing is how do we combat that? How do we make sure that our generations moving forward have the wealth? So when our children's children go out to get a loan, that they have the collateral to do what they need to do. Um, that they don't have to take out hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt to get a job. Uh, that at the end of the day, if they don't have a job, they have a place to stay because their parents, that their family has the property and land to provide for them. Um, that's my, that's, I think our mission should be is how do we leverage this moment now to make sure generations to come have that generational wealth. Well, I think we are just at time. And I just want to say thank you to all of our panelists. I'm inspired by you all. Um, if we, I know at the bottom of your Zoom, there's like a clap option. Maybe we can all give like a little hand clap for our amazing panelists. I'm going to turn it over to our fearless leader, uh, Renee Sally White. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Well, <laughs> I knew this would be the best one ever. And thank you so much. The panelists, you were phenomenal, just phenomenal. Um, Tracy Jackson told me to stop crying. I couldn't help myself. You guys are doing great. Lauren, you did an awesome job. Thank you so much. And um, Michelle, as always, we appreciate your technical assistance. Each panelist, I'm so very, very proud of you. You are, you are my people and I got you. So have a wonderful, wonderful Friday. Enjoy this moment. It's being recorded. We'll get it put out. And we do recognize Hall of Fame people. So Courtney, we have a Hall of Fame website that gives you a whole bunch of Black folks who are trailblazers before us. So everybody have a great Friday. We'll see you next week. Panelists, I need you to stay on. Panelists, stay on. OK. All right. Alrighty. Great job, team. Y'all did amazing. Y'all look good. Y'all sound good. Y'all had great points. AJ, I am so happy. AJ, I'm so happy that you brought up, um, uh, what was it, uh, about the uh, application uh, process for loans. Um, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that is an opportunity for generational wealth, and I think it's an opportunity for the Black dollar to be created again and in our community. 
Um, and how do we do that as credit unions and organizations? So I'm happy that you talked about that briefly and, and Troy as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. AJ, you, you are a smooth brother, AJ. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate it. I'm not as eloquent as you, you know, but I, I try to get my point across. Brother, I'm telling you, man. <laughs> uh, listen, so everybody on LinkedIn, because I need yeah. to send out some. Y'all better yes. be on LinkedIn. Yes. If y'all yes. not, it's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes, on LinkedIn. I couldn't find you at first, AJ. Oh, it's my government on there. I know. I it was just me. <laughs> and then when I saw AJ, I was like, oh, that's AJ. Okay. And what's yeah. your government? Well, <laughs> it depends on who you ask. Now I'm just joking. So my government name, front to back, is Asden J. Sean Lothar. You know, I was gonna give a grand introduction, but I was like, nah, I ain't gonna do it to him like that. I uh, like greetings and salutations, everyone. I'm Asden J. Sean Lothar from CUNA Mutual Group, coming from you live in Madison, Wisconsin. But I decided to guess that way. Okay, wait. I don't know how to spell that. Oh. It's uh, A Z S. D-Y-N. And I'm sure after you type the first few letters, it'll probably pop up. Okay. Let's see where it is. Oh. Got it. Oops. I realized that I, I went out to add you guys and some I, were, I was already following. I was like, wow, I didn't I know. even know I had connected with, with everyone. <laughs> Adrian, would you like to address our panelists? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. All right. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Yep. And so, so you don't see me, but my name is uh, Adrian Johnson. I'm also an AJ, and uh, I'm the Senior Vice President, Chief Financial Officer of uh, Municipal Employees Credit Union here in Baltimore. We're about a $1.2 billion organization. Um, but as far as this call is concerned, I'm the AACC chairman, and I can tell you from what I heard, I want to thank you all for, for, uh, for being panelists today, and certainly you had some great ideas of what we can do mo- moving forward. Uh, just to let you know, I've been in financial services industry uh, for the last uh, almost 42 years. I've been in the credit union space for the last 23 years. I've been CFO for the last 10 years, and um, I am a black man, and many of the hurdles and frustrations that you talk about, I've already experienced, um, and I, I like the analogy with the uh, racetrack, the different, different lanes, um, and the, the, certainly the journey, um, but I will tell you, so I started off, I was 17 years old, right out of high school, and um, I had to figure it out. So the first five years was play, um, and then the next, uh, uh, I guess I've been in accounting, uh, finance in for the last 37 years. And so if you're going to be in the financial service industry, if you're going to work for a financial institution, if you want to move up and you want to get to the big leagues, you're going to have to have a degree. Um, the question is how much you want to pay for that degree. And so that's what you have to figure out. And so my scholarship was working full time during the day, going to school at night, and and uh, getting tuition reimbursement. And so I have an accounting degree, I have a master's. All accounting degree was night school, uh, master's was Saturday school. I am now a teacher for at the community college that I attended, and um, like I said decade. And so there are some successes, but it's not going to be easy. Um, but one of the things I found hard, what, one of the things I found which you do have is work and you do have to get involved and you do have to have a network. And so there's a power, there's a power, I always talk about the power of the network. And so you all should have to develop a network while you're young. So I, you know, over the years I've developed relationships with folks across the country. So whatever I go, whatever I need, if I don't know it, I, I can pick up the phone and I've got a resource. Um, and so you're you're younger, a lot younger, but I would you're eight, and I would. Come
coming through the ranks, and it was a lot more different than the way it is now. So if I can make it, you can certainly make it too. Um, but it is a journey. It is not a sprint. And so if you think you're going to get there overnight, it ain't going to happen. But if you if you have some patience, if you have a great work ethic, if you develop uh, your network as you go along, um, and you gotta you gotta deal with people that are going to help you get to where you want to go. And so when I look at Renee with our professional development uh, efforts. She's always interested in helping elevate young people. And so that's a person that you certainly want to make sure um, you get, uh, you stay connected with. Um, other young folks um, around the organization, which um, Renee can certainly talk to you about. Um, but my, my personal uh, story has to do with Tracy Jackson, who is a CFO now for Credit Union in Texas. Tracy and I worked together for about 10 years, but when Tracy came with me, she started working with me, and I say with me, I could say she worked for me, but I say worked with me. I had to sit her down and say, you know, you're not going to be the star, I'm not going to be patting you on your back every time you make a move, but if you stick with me, you will be successful. So she, 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 she quieted down, and she stuck with me for 10 years proud of where she is today. So that could be you. And so there's a way, um, there's a way to do things, there's a way to get things done. At some point you will have, if you don't have now, you will have a voice of influence. I'm an introvert, um, but I understand my role. And so I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not one of those persons that talk about things happening. I make things happen. And so um, a lot of times it's not what we say, it's what we do. And so, like I said, I think you're in the right space at the right time. Um, this organization is front and center um, on a lot of fronts. Um, and so when I heard Troy talk about the cab situation, been there, done that so many times. Um, and so um, those microaggressions, I didn't even know the word until two weeks ago, but all that stuff, uh, that we've been through over time. Uh, but I think somebody mentioned about wealth, wealth building. That's what I'm about right now. That, that is the only thing I'm about right now. And so uh, helping people uh, develop um, um, financially because at the end of the day, if you do what you need to do, and it's not what you make, it's what you do with what you make. And so I had my first house when I was 26 years old. Um, I had my house built. I'm the first black person, I'm the first person in my family to go to college. And so I'm the first person to have a, a, a degree, a master's. So I have a daughter who's 33 years old, who is second generation degree, second generation master's, uh, and also, but she's first generation. She told me last Sunday on, or last Saturday, the day before Father's Day, that she stays her financial advisor. I thought it was, I thought I was her financial advisor. But she told me, her financial advisor told her that she stays on this track. She'll be a millionaire by the time she's 57. So only thing I can say is she listened to her father. So she is her father's child. Um, and so multiple streams of income. I've always had a part-time job. Um, you, you know, you will never make as much money as you think you should be making, but you gotta save, you gotta have decent credit. So, and you got to be willing to help others and teach others. Save as much money as you can. Make sure your credit is where it needs to be. And it, it, it will go through cycles. I've been through a divorce. Um, I've been remarried. My wife is not even working. She hasn't worked since uh, November, Black Friday, 2017. And so we still make it work. And so in this pandemic, this COVID, whatever is going on, we're investing as opposed to um, digress, you know, and, and so we're, we're making things happen. So as you go through, you got to make it happen. And so, you know, I, I always talk about when, when things don't go my way, I have my little pay party for a couple of days and then, you know, we're back at it. You know, what can we do? And so um, two wives, two kids, been through it all. And so, 
some point you're going to experience some of these things. I will tell you one thing you will experience, you will have some kind of hiccup, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's a, a, a recession, you will have some type of hiccup. The question is, what are you ready for? And so I'm inspired by you and start, make me start thinking about all the things that I've been through. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you individually can make an impact, but it starts with you. So nobody else, it starts with you. And then you, as, as you become successful, people watch you. And they want, they're inspired by you. And then all of a sudden you have this influence. And so um, I came to this crazy, you know, I was 36 years old. I'm in the last, almost the last five years of my career. And so latch on to people like Renee. She can put you in touch with folks that can help it make it a lot easier for you. So we're all in this thing together. So I didn't want to take too much of your time, but some inspiring stuff, some motivating stuff. Um, but you're not alone. That's the thing. You're not alone. And for some reason, just because it happened to you now in, in twenty in the twenty first century, you feel like, you know, geez, no. We're we're all in this together. And, and so um, AACUC can make that journey a lot easier just through the connection. I'll turn it over. Thank you. Again, thank you. Great job. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Sheila, I see we, 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 we've let you in the after party. I would love for you to address the panelists, um, especially because I'm going to tell them very quickly um, that one of the reasons why I'm here at ACC is because Sheila embraced me, treats me like a friend. She treats me like a valued colleague. Um, but she has, and she will get in my behind like I get in y'all. So just know that I'm not too old to get. Um, people, people give me constructive criticism all the time. Um, I am coached by my younger people. I am coached by um, my colleagues. I'm coached by my peers. And so um, I just want you to know, I want you to hear a little bit from Sheila. Sheila, can you unmute yourself and talk to, talk to the panelists? This is to be very, very short because I'm driving and I'm not even sure if okay. you can hear me well going through we can. the countryside. We can. But I want to just echo, oh great, I want to echo everything that uh, Adrian has said. I, he took all my words. But I will say this, you cannot be successful alone. People make you successful. So if you're trying to prove your worth, understand you can never prove your work. Your work is proven by how other people perceive you. I am just elated. Hold on just a second. I'm elated about the fact that we're having this opportunity. This is going to be something that you will take with you for, oh my God, the rest of your life. And this will be here for you. And thank you so much, today for allowing this to happen for you because that is not normal in any profession. So really appreciate that. Thank you, Sheila. Appreciate you. Um, panelists, just an extraordinary job, truly. Um, you touched, moved, and inspired me like I knew you would. Didn't have a clue of what you might say and what might come out of your mouth, but everything that came out was gold. So if I were, um, if I were uh, someone who was getting ready to receive all the money, all the gold for all the work that you guys did, all the ways that you inspired people, I received so many different texts while you guys were speaking about how great this is and are you recording and can we share it and just people really, really inspired by you. And I don't know if you noticed, but there was 130 people at the Apex. That's the most we've ever had. And about 120 people stayed on, 122 people stayed on the line the entire time. So again, thank you. I know that they're going to ask me, um, can you guys come back? I'm asking you now, please come back. Um, AJ, you were so smooth. Uh, 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 AJL, not AJ Johnson. Uh, AJL, you were so smooth. I said, mm, he might have to be an MC for one of my sessions. So yes, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, is there anything that you guys need to say to be complete? Is there anything that you want to talk about? Um, do you have anything that you want to say? Um, uh, about the panel. How was your experience on the panel? 
Okay, now you know I'll start calling our names. Uh, um, I, I, I'll, I'll, go ahead, Courtney. Go ahead, Dre. Okay, I was going to thank Lauren, first of all, for an, a beautiful job moderating uh, mm -hmm. the panel today um, and making it flow so naturally uh, where we could all just jump in and express ourselves, so thank you. And to Renee and, and all the leadership at AACUC, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, and for Renee's reception to the idea <laughs> when I brought it to her, um, to, to give young professionals a space to express ourselves on a panel like this. So thank you. And you said online chat. So um, Lauren is our liaison for CUNA and Jim, has, Jim Nussel has offered us that capability. So we'll talk about that and Lauren, look, look, so you didn't give me a new project, you gave Lauren a new project, so. <laughs> I came back to get me, but it's okay because I think that was a great idea, Courtney. So it I is a great idea. And, and and literally yesterday we had that call with Jim. So Jim Jim says, we can offer you this this feature of online and people can, I say, hey, that works for me. I just hadn't got around to telling you about it yet. So that's right. good. Okay. Yeah. Next. So I just, uh, I feel, super blessed and grateful to be a part of this panel and i just loved everything that everybody had to say um it was inspiring to me and that's why i wake up i wake up to be inspired and and you guys inspire me to go through this weekend and next week just uh rejuvenated and ready to move forward um i just want to say thank you renee for asking me to join the panel um and we we should all like connect, stay connected. Um, just another way of networking and share ideas. Like, hey, if you have a question, I mean, I'm open to anytime you have a question or want to pick my brain about something that you might want to share, but want to run it past me, I'm here. I'm available. <laughs> um, so it was a great. I had I had fun. It was a a great um, panel. A great group of people. Um, I see the women out outnumber the men, but AJ and Troy, you are like they fantastic. I love your analogies, your ideas, your what you had to say from a from a male perspective. Um, I I also loved your Troy your track analogy and like Lauren. I see the link that you sent in the chat, but can you send it like to my email so I can look at it? Um, I'm share it in the email. Yeah, that's all I have to say. I just wanted to say uh, thank you to Renee. Um, I almost didn't make it, <laughs> but <clears throat> I'm so happy that I did. You guys are all truly inspiring. Um, all your stories, everything that you shared today, I was just blown away. So um, I thank you for just being so open and authentic. Um, but I, I'm also blessed to be a part of this. And that, like Tisha said, I definitely would like to um, connect with you guys and just learn more. And if I need something or if you need something, please feel free to, to reach out. I just want to say all y'all are amazing. I don't know how I ended up I'm sitting on this with all of you brilliant minds and you great spirits, but y'all had amazing input, amazing ideas, just phenomenal people hearing about your accomplishments and what you've done. And I'm, I'm, I'm privileged, you know, to be, have been able to share this space with all of y'all. So I thank you, Miss Renee, for all that you've done. You're going to be my auntie for life. I was waiting to give you a big old hug in August in Florida, but I'm going to have to hug you from a distance. <laughs> Michelle, you're amazing, you know. I don't know all that you do, but I'm sure that you are a phenomenal, exemplary, just woman of all tricks and trades. And you know what you're doing. Lauren, your, your moderator. Right, right, My goodness. right. Just good. This the man grace. Is smooth, the man. grace that you have. Yeah, he is. <laughs> Amazing. He should have said all of our thank yous just from AJ. Everything AJ. <laughs> I know. Can he introduce <laughs> us next time? Like, <laughs> right. But really, thank all of you so much. So much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. We look forward to you. Yes, yeah, so, uh, to piggyback off of AJ, I will not be that smooth um, because he is a smooth guy. Um, but I do want to say thank you. Thank you for thinking of me. Thank you for this opportunity for me to grow and evolve um, and to learn from others. So I am really appreciative 
um, and reminded that I need to aim to be legendary, that I need to aim to leave a legacy behind. Um, so thank you for that. And Lauren. Um, I, I just to echo everyone's sentiments. I'm inspired. I think to be quite frank, it, I often get discouraged being one of one in a in a place where it seems like I'm the only one, where no one can empathize and understand. And you know, I think I feel like I've left today. Just my spirit is full, you know. And so if that's because of all of you guys. Just to read your bios, I'm just like people like this exists in the credit union movement. And I just want to like share your stories like with all of the world, because honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm speechless and I'm just happy to have moderated this discussion. And of course, thank you to Renee and Michelle because they're just, their fearless leadership is what holds us, keeps us all together. Well, Lauren, you did an extraordinary job. And uh, so thank you. And I love, I love that we were able to um, be professional, look great, um, you all were very articulate and poised and confident, as I knew you would be, um, along with this, the, the analogies that you were given were so great. Um, AJ, I really liked what you said about the banking, um, that, that loan, that alternative loan. That reminds me of some stuff that Sheila Montgomery would do at her credit union. So it's just, and that's the, that's the other thing, knowing your credit union people, being members, um, go, deep, go deep with that. Sheila once told me, your credit is raggedy and you are a businesswoman, you need to get it together. And um, they helped me get a, a cash secured loan and I got it together. And so, um, you know, it, it, we, we all go through. And so um, just beautiful. Absolutely adored the, the, the track, the track um, analogy. Perfect. I'm gonna steal that. Letting you know I'm stealing that. I'm a trainer. I loved it. I'll give you credit, but I loved it. Um, just, to, just all the answers were phenomenal. Um, Miranda, just so you know, I told Gary that you killed it because I loved it. Um, Leisha, you know, you, you, you already know, you know, you have to, you know, you have to bring it and you brought it, girl, you brought it. And Courtney, obviously just, just always, always great. And Tisha, you know, I can always count on you and I, and I appreciate you for that. I do appreciate that. Appreciate you for that. So Michelle, do you have any parting words for our panelists? Um, I would say thank you again. You all were phenomenal. Uh, but in your careers, be fearless. You know, we all have, we feel fear, but we use it to fuel ourselves. So let your fear fuel you. Um, have some mentors that you can call and talk with um, who can lead you, guide you, and propel you where uh, you're supposed to be. Um, and just, you know, just keep plugging away. Um, as you all were talking, I thought about last weekend, um, the TikTok teens and the, um, what's the other group, the K-pop stands. I'm not sure if you heard this or not, but they are taking credit for uh, derailing President Trump's um, rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma. What I would say to you, I don't know if it's true or not, but what I am going to challenge you all to do is how can you use this TikTok and the K stands, the K pop stands? I think they're from Russia, maybe a different, it's another country, but they got together and figured out how to make it look like millions of people were going to attend the rally. I'm not saying do that, but what I am saying is how do you take that technology and use it in the credit union movement? Um, you know, we have started this commitment to change, uh, Credit Unions United Against Racism. How do we take that technology and how do we eradicate the racism? How do we move your careers forward? How do we move AACUC and our people forward? So I would leave you to think about that. And then Courtney, thank you uh, so much for volunteering for um, some of those initiatives uh, during the call. You knew that was coming, um, but no, thank yeah. you. I think that you are all phenomenal. If there's anything that I can ever do for you, uh, please let me know. I'm happy to assist. All right, and with that, if you don't mind, I would like to close this out in prayer. Is that okay? All right, please bow your heads. 
Heavenly Father, we just come before you so grateful that this call was phenomenal, Lord. I just knew it would be. So thank you for allowing the panelists to do what they do. They shine the light, Lord. The brightness just came through the, through the Zoom call, Lord. I know that everybody who was on that call was blessed. Those who are going to hear this recording, it will they will be blessed as well. Lord, we just ask that today and tomorrow and the rest of the days of their lives, that you continue to bless them, you guide them, and you cover these young people, Lord, as they have their careers in Credit Union Land or whatever financial institution that they end up in. Lord, let them know that they are covered by ACC. Whatever they need, we have them. Lord, we just ask that you continue to bless them and their families. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Thank you, Renee. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye, Bye, guys. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye, guys. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>